Welcome to the training video for the Sonographic Evaluation of Central Line Placement, or C-Clip study. The objectives of this presentation are to provide information about our study to research associates as well as healthcare providers, to train research associates to recruit patients and collect study data, to train providers to alert research associates to eligible patients for enrollment, and to train providers to obtain the necessary ultrasound views for this study. Ultrasound guidance for central lines, especially internal jugular lines, is a standard of care. Multiple large studies, including the SOAP studies, have concluded that ultrasound guidance reduces needle temps and complication rates, as well as improving success in obtaining central venous access. However, the chest x-ray is still routinely used to confirm adequate line placement, as well as to route complications such as pneumothorax. A line that is adequately placed should be within 2 cm of the sinoatrial junction. A line that is too proximal to this has an increased risk of thrombosis. A line that is in the right atrium or the right ventricle has an increased risk of dysrhythmias as well as, raw, as well as wall rupture or injury. The disadvantages to this current approach for line placement are one that the time needed for a chest x-ray to be obtained post placement delays the use of that line and thus medications such as antibiotics, blood products, or vasoactive medications. Second, a chest x-ray performed after the procedure ends, so it cannot detect complications that may be corrected while the provider maintains his or her sterile precautions. Third, a chest x-ray is a poor modality for detecting pneumothorax in the supine patient. It, its sensitivity is borders about 50%. This is important as the patient on positive pressure ventilation may more readily and quickly develop a tension pneumothorax from a relatively small pneumothorax. Many researchers believe that ultrasound may pr prove a better modality in confirming line placement. The advantage would be an ability to assess for complications during or immediately after the procedure and before the sterile field is compromised. This would allow for correction of the misplaced line or immediate management of a pneumothorax. Secondly, the ultrasound provides for direct visualization of the central venous catheter within the lumen of the vessel. Third, it is highly sensitive for detecting pneumothorax in the supine patient with a sensitivity above 95%. And last, there is no radiation exposure for ultrasound that it, there is with plain radiographs or CT scans. There are disadvantages with ultrasound in line placement. First, it is heavily operator dependent. Often, it requires at least 100 scans before an operator prof is proficient in many of these views. Second, it requires longer bedside evaluation. Third, it cannot directly visualize the tip in relation to the sinoatrial junction. Prior studies have looked at specific stable populations, such as those undergoing elective surgery in the OR, or they were case reports or small studies. Our study will focus on patients that emergently need central venous access, which is typical of most patients that need central venous access. It is also one of the first studies to incorporate multiple specialties, from emergency medicine to critical care and surgery. If we are able to demonstrate that bedside ultrasound is a reliable modality for confirming central line placement, the next step would be to demonstrate this in a randomized clinical trial, in which ultrasound will be able to affect clinical management. The ultimate goal is to demonstrate that ultrasound is just as reliable as chest x-ray in confirming central line placement and detecting complications. The study design is as follows. Once a central line is placed or a decision is made to place a central line, the treating team will alert the study team that a patient may be enrolled for the study. The research associate will assess el eligibility criteria and if eligible will enroll the patient. The central line will be inserted and the sonographer will obtain his or her ultrasound images. The sonographer will then relay their interpretation to the study team. The chest x-ray may be done prior to ultrasound scan, but the sonographer must be blind to both the image and the interpretation. Once the formal interpretation of the chest x-ray is made, the research associate will record the results on the data sheet. Finally, the study team will, will review and analyze the data. There are key points to the study. First, while the research associates will routinely approach the providers regarding patients that may be eligible for the study, 
The treatment team should alert the research associates as well to potential study patients. Second, the sonographer will be a pulmonary and critical care fellow or attending, or they may be an emergency medicine attending or resident. Residents that are not trained to perform these scans will not be performing the ultrasound scans for these studies. Third, the sonographer must not see the chest x-ray or know of any interpretation of the chest x-ray prior to performing their ultrasound scan. And lastly, the interpretation of the ultrasound scan should not be relayed to the treating team in order to change management. The treating team should not base patient management on the ultrasound images or interpretation. Patients are eligible for the study if they are over age 18, if they are not pregnant, and if they require a central line in the subclavian vein or internal jugular vein. They must be capable of providing consent or have a sur surrogate that can provide consent on their behalf. What if the patient can't consent? A common problem that arises is that the patient will be altered and lacks the capacity at that time to give consent. The study team will attempt to obtain consent from a surrogate, such as a family member or spouse. However, if no surrogate is available, the study team will, will proceed with obtaining the time-sensitive and necessary data for the study, namely the ultrasound scans and interpretations. The study team will continue to attempt to obtain consent for study enrollment when the patient's condition improves or a surrogate is available. If consent is then obtained, the patient will be enrolled in the study and the incomplete data will be collected at that time. If consent is not given, then the patient and the ultrasound scans will be excluded from the study and the, the data will be deleted. In order to use ultrasound to confirm central line placement, we will obtain four views. The first is the central line catheter with an lumen of the vessel and just one to two centimeters distal to the insertion point or closer to the heart. The second view will be that of the central veins to assess for errant migration of the catheter. For example, if a right IJ is placed, the sonographer will obtain an ipsilateral subclavian view as well as a left IJ and a left subclavian view. We recognize that some views may be more difficult to obtain, so we leave the number of views to the sonographer. The third view will be of the pleural interface specifically looking for movement between the visceral and parietal pleura. The last view will be a cardiac view of the right atrium while approximately 5 to 10 cc's of normal saline is used and flushed via one of the central line catheters. For the first view of the catheter within the lumen of the vessel, we will use a high frequency linear probe. We will place it in the short axis similar to the method for ultrasound guidance and internal jugular placement. Starting from just distal to the insertion and moving in the direction of the heart, a standard six second clip will be adequate to visualize the catheter in the lumen at two points. If there is any doubt, the probe may be rotated 90 degrees to obtain a long axis view of the catheter within the lumen. This is an example of the catheter within the lumen of the internal jugular. There is shadowing at the top of the screen corresponding to about 11 o'clock and it tracks towards the lumen. This is the catheter descending into the lumen of the vessel which we see now when we overgain the image as a hypochoic circular structure. In this long axis view as seen in this image, the catheter is a hyperechoic linear structure that is clearly within the lumen of the vessel. The next set of views to obtain concern misplacement or migration of the catheter away from the SA junction. Remember that an adequately placed central line travels down the SVC and terminates within 2 centimeters of the sinoatrial junction, as indicated by the arrow on the image on the left. A misplaced central line can migrate from the ipsilateral subclavian to the ipsilateral IJ and vice versa or it can migrate to the contralateral side to the contralateral IJ or subclavian. These are two examples of misplaced central lines as seen on chest x-rays. The image to the left shows a right subclavian that has migrated to the ipsilateral IJ. The image on the right shows a right subclavian that has migrated to the contralateral subclavian. To assess for a misplaced catheter via ultrasound, we will first use a linear probe. 
we'll obtain single views of the vessel lumen in short axis and we'll overgain in order to detect any catheters that are errantly in the lumen. We'll obtain as many views of vessels as possible recognizing that some vessels are harder to image on ultrasound than others. To obtain a subclavian vein view, orient the indicator to the patient's head and at the midclavicular line or where the clavicle angle starts to flatten medially. The green bar on the left image is where the probe should be placed. From this position, scan laterally to image the subclavian vein. Oftentimes, the subclavian vein is directly under the clavicle, so it may be helpful to pull the ipsilateral shoulder inferiorly so that the subclavian can be displaced inferiorly. The image on the right shows the corresponding ultrasound image with the clavicle to the left or closest to the indicator. The subclavian vessels will run anterior or superficial to the lung pleura. So use a visceral parietal pleural interface as a landmark as well as a clavicle for the superior border. The subclavian artery has thicker walls and is usually smaller than the vein. In this image, the artery is anterior to vein, but this may change over the course. Color Doppler may also help to distinguish the two, as pulsatile flow may indicate artery, while constant flow would indicate vein. Once the location of the subclavian vein is established, overgain the image to detect any errant catheter in the lumen. The next view to obtain is to assess for pneumothorax. We'll continue to use the linear probe, indicator still pointed towards the patient's head. We'll scan at the ipsilateral side of the needle insertion at the second to fourth intercostal space. We will ensure also that the probe is perpendicular to the skin surface and in fact between an intercostal space. From this you should obtain an ultrasound image as we see on the screen. This is a color diagram of the previous ultrasound image. What we see is that essentially between the probe and the layer represented by six is the skin. Below that is the subcutaneous space and below that and represented by number four are the pectoralis and intercostal muscles in cross-section. One are the ribs and three are the neurovascular bundles that are traveling inferior to the ribs. The visceral parietal pleural interface is represented by the blue line labeled 2. In a normal lung, the visceral and parietal pleura are tightly opposed. Inspiration or expiration will result in a sliding of these two surfaces, which on ultrasound appears as sliding or shimmering. Some point out that this may appear to be ants marching. This indicates that there is no pneumothorax. When there is no shimmering or lung sliding, there are two major causes. The first is pneumothorax, or air intrusion between the parietal and visceral pleura. The second cause is more nonspecific and may be seen in apneic patients or those with low tidal volume, such as patients who are ventilated with high PEEP or patients that have chronic obstructive lung disease and suffer from hyperinflation of the lungs. The last view to obtain is for assessment of correct tip placement or within 2 centimeters of the sinoatrial junction. This is a two-person technique. The sonographer will first obtain an appropriate view of the right atrium and begin to record a six second clip. In the meantime, the assistant will inject about five to 10 cc's of normal saline via one of the central line ports. If the central line is appropriately placed, then normal saline will appear as temporary opacification of the right atrium and right ventricle. If the catheter tip is not placed in the correct position, there will be a delay in opacification or no opacification at all. In order to obtain a view of the right atrium, use the P21 or cardiac probe. You may obtain a subxiphoid view, a parasonal short, or apical four-chamber view of the heart. We recommend, however, that you attempt the subxiphoid view first as it is easiest to obtain, followed by the parasternal short, and then the apical four-chamber view. In certain patients, especially those with morbid obesity, or those that have underwent abdominal surgery, the parasonal short view may be preferred. The image on the top shows the probe location for
for the personal short, apical four chamber, as well as the sub xiphoid views. The image on the bottom shows the different axes of the heart that are obtained from these views. The short axis corresponds to the personal short view and it's in the yellow plane. The blue plane shows the personal long axis view, whereas the green plane shows the apical four chamber view. The sub xiphoid plane is not seen on this image. To obtain a sub xiphoid view of the heart, first remember that you're obtaining the heart in an oblique coronal plane. Place your probe underneath the costal margin, just right of the xiphoid process. Have the indicator point to the patient's right. You will use the liver as an acoustic window, meaning you will want to have a good image of the liver first and have your sound waves go through the liver to the heart and back. If you try to do this via the stomach or the lungs, you will only get scatter and artifact. Once you're able to image the liver, angle your probe towards the patient's left shoulder and begin to move the probe more medially towards the xiphoid process. You will be able to image the heart at this point and you will want to adjust your depth accordingly to maximize your view of the right side of the heart. You will also be able to use the zoom function to focus on the heart as well. Once a good sub xiphoid view of the heart is visualized, have the assistant ready with the saline flush. Press clip and have the assistant push the saline. The sonographer may also use the zoom function to center the image on the right atrium. The clip to the left shows normal saline opacifying the right atrium and right ventricle after being flushed with normal saline. If a sub xiphoid view is not appropriate or inadequate, the sonographer may choose the personal short view. First start with a probe perpendicular to the skin. It may also be easier to start with a personal long view. Please refer to the lecture on a cardiac ultrasound for proper technique. Once the personal long view is obtained, rotate the probe 90 degrees so the indicators point towards the patient's right forearm or elbow. Slowly move the, the probe towards the base of the heart until the aortic valve is visualized, which is commonly described as a Mercedes-Benz sign. At the level of the aortic valve, the right atrium is to the left, along with the tricuspid valve and leading into the right ventricle. Look for a pacification here with normal saline injection. If the sub xiphoid and parasternal short views are inappropriate or inadequate, attempt the apical four chamber view. Start at the apex of the heart, which may be palpated as the point of maximal impulse or just medial to the PMI. The probe should be pointed to the right ear or shoulder, and the indicator should be pointed at the patient's right flank or hip. Remember that this is an oblique coronal view of the heart, so the probe angle should be within 45 degrees to parallel with the skin. The sonographer may also have to scan from one intercostal space to the next to obtain the best view, or if possible, place the patient in left lateral decubitus positioning. An adequate four chamber view will show all four chambers with the right side of the heart at the left of the image. This is where opacification should occur if the line is appropriately positioned and saline is flushed. In summary, the research is or where there is no one to consent, the ultrasound images may be obtained prior to consent. Once the patient is consentable or surrogate is found, then the study team will obtain consent. If no consent is given, the images will be deleted and the patient excluded from the study. Third, the sonographer must be blinded to the chest x-ray image and any interpretation prior to performance and interpretation of the ultrasound scans. Last, the ultrasound should not change management of the patient. The chest x-ray or another established imaging modality for central line placement must be used for clinical decision making. As for the ultrasound views, the sonographer should obtain images of the catheter in the lumen, check for misplacement of the catheter in the other central veins, including the ipsilateral and contralateral side, assess for pneumothorax on the ipsilateral lung with a thoracic ultrasound, and obtain a view of the right atrium with normal saline injection. Remember that an assistant is needed for the normal saline flush. Okay, now let's address some commonly asked questions. First, what can a research associate do to avoid missing any patients for enrollment? 
First, if working in the ED, make yourself available for all critical trauma and ALS patients. They have the highest likelihood of requiring an emergent central line, and often central lines are inserted and chest x-rays are taken and interpreted within minutes. Second, if in the ICU, ask the attending fellow or residents if any patients potentially require central lines. An important time to ask is after the team has rounded. Often the decision to place the central line is made during these rounds. Third, check the grease board or census regularly for new patients. Take note of vital sign abnormalities like hypotension or systolic blood pressure under 90 or tachycardia with a heart rate greater than 100. These patients may require a central line. Another question is, what if the patient doesn't speak English or Spanish? Can they still be enrolled? The answer is yes. Use an interpreter to assist with the consent and use the English language consent form. You should write the interpreter's name in the relevant section on the consent. The next question is, can a person with a central line be enrolled when medication has already been given through the central line? The answer usually is no. This is because medication through the line implies that line placement has already been evaluated by chest x-ray and deemed appropriate. Therefore, the sonographer will be biased with his or her interpretation of the ultrasound. One exception in which a patient may be enrolled when medication has been given through the central line is in cases where emergent vascular access was needed. For example, a patient who has coded had a central line placed during the code and had medication given through the line during the code may still be eligible for enrollment only if a chest x-ray was not obtained or interpreted prior to ultrasound. This leads to the next question. When should the ultrasound be performed? Ideally, ultrasound should be performed immediately after the line insertion procedure is completed. This usually means when the sterile drape is removed and prior to chest x-ray. Sometimes the proceduralist or the physician inserting the central line may opt to perform the ultrasound while still sterilely draped. This is fine, but the ultrasound images must not lead the physician to change the position of the line by pulling it back, reinserting the guide wire, etc. If this happens, please document on the collection sheet the details. Also, a clear tegaderm dressing should be placed at the insertion site prior to the ultrasound to minimize infection, but there is a low risk of infection even if tegaderm has not been applied. Another question is whether repeated boluses of normal saline will clinically affect the patient. The answer is no. Small normal saline flushes are used often by the nurses after administration of medications to flush the medications. You may inform the nurse, however, that normal saline flush is required for the study and he or she may wish to assist with this view. Next question. How do I know if the ultrasound machine is actually recording? First, remember that hitting clip will record a clip and hitting save will record the image. So press freeze before you press save. When you do press clip or save, the disk icon on the, on the right side of the screen will scroll and flash blue. Files will also automatically upload to the server wirelessly if the Wi-Fi reception is seen on the right. It looks like reception bars on your cell phone. Next, the disk icon shows the percent of memory left for storage. So if it is running low, say below 25%, you may have to go to the review section and delete archived images. Please ask someone familiar with the machine if you are uncomfortable doing this. The image to the left shows with the green pointed arrow the disk icon and below that 100%. This means that 100% of the storage is available to save any images or clips. The image to right shows the keyboard for a typical sonocyte. It shows the review button on the top right followed by the clip, save, and the freeze buttons in the bottom center. Thank you for watching this training video and for helping with the study. If you have any questions, please ask one of our study investigators.